welcome back to another season. Wait, not season. Episode 40. <laughs> no, episode 39. Uh, we have 38 episodes of content out so far. And uh, this is our 39th episode, so I'm very excited to dive right into this. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, how to earn more playing time. And first off, we're going to start off with our Mental Monday quote. So I'll let Gannon start off with his. Yeah, so mine was from the Mentality Instagram account. Like, I've had a quote from them before. I really like it. So they just post daily reminders and stuff. And one of them is, I f- it feels like I work my hardest when I'm at my lowest, you know. And that's kind of big because I think that follows a line of, like, emptying the tank. Because, like, sometimes you're going to be pushing. Your limits are going to be really tested based on, you know, how much endurance you have left. And sometimes when stuff gets tough and you're running on empty or something with the gas tank, you got to push through it. So then when that hustle and all that work that you do, to get to it so then everything on the back side will be to come to fruition it'll be worth it in the end so i think that's kind of big even when it might may seem down at the moment just know that hard work's gonna end up paying off in the long run yeah i mean that's what it comes down to it actually kind of relates to my quote with winning and and hard work and uh, my quote says i'm passionate about this game and i'm passionate about winning my passion is always positive uh, and that quote's from des bryant one of my Favorite, if not my favorite uh, NFL player that I've ever ever watched growing up. He was kind of my role model. Uh, I was a wide receiver in high school, as I've mentioned probably many times already. But watching Des Bryant play always brought uh, a great Sunday for me. It was always a great Sunday or even a Monday, Thursday, whatever, whatever day they were playing. But that to me what that quote means is a lot of people knock on the man Des Bryant for being uh, – kind of like a crybaby in a sense. Uh, But it was never about him not getting the ball. It was more so about him just being so passionate that he hated to lose. And when it comes to me- when it comes down to mental health and understanding your mentals, if you're under- if you have a a sense of understanding that you you can't lose. If you learn to to learn to not lose ever. And uh, if you fail, turn it into a positive. And that's kind of what Dez uh, did when he resurrected his career as of late with this year, coming back to play with the Baltimore Ravens after he took off some time uh, due to mental health reasons after getting cut by the Dallas Cowboys. And uh, to say it bluntly, he went through hell. Uh, Dez had injuries, he had depression, anxiety, and he fought his way back to the NFL. And I think that's a a story that everybody should learn to understand, uh, the Dez Bryant story, because... He went through a lot, and he, he battled his demons and made it out. So uh, that's that's Mental Monday for you guys. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, we're, we're very excited to be back. Three weeks, it feels like <laughs> forever. Yeah. Uh, absolutely forever. But uh, uh, before we dive into how to earn some more playing time for your uh, selective sports, I kind of want to just touch on stuff that I've been working on the last couple weeks and kind of just – explain to our audience what I've what I've been up to the last couple weeks and I'll start that off with uh, a couple weeks ago I got reached out to by Eric Kienefeld uh, with Big Radio which is located um, in the, the A15 area which is where Gannon and I are from and through this podcast I was able to get an opportunity to try out radio so I happened to call the Aquin Milledgeville game and that was quite an experience. Um, I'm not going to lie. That was, I haven't had that much fun in a long time. Being able to do something like that was brand new to me. And it's an opportunity I created through this podcast, just showing people that I'm, I'm not afraid to talk. I'm not afraid to be social and I'm not afraid to put my face and my voice out for everyone to see some other things that I've been up to, uh, obviously homework, college, you know, it's a grind. Again, I can probably tell you a little bit more about that grind in a minute, but Another thing I have coming up this Thursday is uh, I'll be joining the Denver Broncos Zoom call. Uh, Keegan Jalen, one of the members of our team, uh, pointed me in that direction. So I'm going to try to learn some information about how the front office operations work within the Denver Broncos Broncos organization. So I'm really excited for that as well. And honestly, other than that, I've just been helping out with the Aquam Bulldogs football team and learning the ins and outs of coaches. Shout out to Brock Kunder, Dan Blackburn, uh, Tyson Gron, uh, Matt Doherty, them guys. I've been able to pick up a lot of new information from them guys. And the last three to four weeks we've been gone, you know, I've picked up on a lot of new information. I'm excited to share that with you guys. But, yeah, and what you've been up to? 
No, but yeah, before I dive into what I've been up to during the break, you know, I was happy for Bryce. It was really cool to see that because I know that he was excited just telling from his emotions and stuff when he first told me about it and just to see him saw some of the pictures, was able to listen to some snippets of it because I was actually playing a game while he was calling the Aquam game, which was kind of sucks. I'd like to be able to listen to it. But no, it was cool to see that because, you know, that's one of the cool things with this podcast is allowing both of us and it's specifically Bryce and this is instance to um show his talents off for the people just not through the podcast but get his name out there on the radio scene but you know i've been busy uh the break went by quick with me you know we've been playing a lot of baseball we've had games we just had a uh, five games in the last three days so an off day was nice today so it was nice to get the podcast in and but other than that it's just been busy a lot of school work a lot of just grinding this last couple of weeks of the semester so you just fin- finish out the school year and get back to work yeah, if you can't tell, we're both very excited to be done with school. Uh, it's coming <laughs> fast, so I'm very excited for that. It's wearing on us. It is, it is. But all right. So how do you earn more playing time, whether it's football, basketball, volleyball, golf, whatever it is, whatever it comes down to, how do you how do you prove to your coaches that you deserve to be out on the field, the court, whatever it is, in any, any form of arena, how do you do that? And uh, I actually came across a tweet yesterday that, Uh, sparked this conversation and i wanted to talk about this with gannon it came from sports psychology on twitter which i'm pretty sure gannon follows too yeah and it says i pointed uh, that one out that's a good that's a good source of information for sure and uh that tweet it says five ways to impress your coach and earn more playing time so we'll just go through the line there's five five different ones we'll start off with the first one and then we'll talk about it and then the second one and so on Uh, so we'll break it down into five sections and that'll be it for this episode so the first one says, it's, it's pretty basic, it says work your hardest. Uh, so, Gannon, I mean, you're, you're playing college ball right now, so what are you telling these younger kids? What does work your hardest mean? I mean, work your hardest, is, I mean, that's pretty general because I know probably more of these other – the other four that we're going to talk about are more um, detailed and more specific for, like, on-the-field stuff. But this one's, you know, work hard is just with everything, and that's not only when you're just a practice or at the games or in front of your coach, what are you doing in the downtime besides that with your time management skills, with homework, you know, getting to your weightlifting sessions, getting a good lifting in, you know, not half-assing it and not really getting much out of it. Make sure the studies are all that, all that type of stuff, keeping your body in good shape, eating the right foods, staying hydrated, all that type of stuff. That's working hard because that's, you know, gearing towards your finished product, which is yourself. So you can be the best person you can on and off the field. So, I think those off the field stuff, if you're doing that and holding yourself accountable there, will go a really long way for you working harder and getting more stuff and more time on the field. How, yeah. What do you think about that? No, I think when it comes down to working your hardest, I think it's so basic that it's almost very complex at the same time because a lot of athletes. People myself, forget about it. Yeah, myself included when I, when I played football, basketball, baseball. It's almost a thing you take for granted when you're growing up to work your hardest. And an example that I can I can explain kind of is when I was in high school and I was playing football, I was kind of gifted, uh, not going to say like a muscular tone. Like I was kind of gifted with that uh, from through genes. And I think I kind of took for granted how much better I could have been if I would have worked and worked and worked. And uh, I actually saw another, there was another quote the other day. It said, okay, it was good players, good players work out, great players outwork. And to me, that speaks volumes. That speaks volumes to work your hardest. If you outwork someone that's just working out, that's just going through the motions, uh, you're going to be better off. Trust me on that. That's good. That's good. And so when it came down to, for me, when I graduated high school, and I mean, you always reflect on the past and and you start (laughs) to look back at those, those days and. Uh, I still reminisce on the football days. Those were the days that, I mean, you don't get anything like you don't get anything to replace that. But it almost made me realize that, like, there was a time in my life playing football growing up, you don't think about certain things, and and then when you graduate and you reflect on it, you're like, wow, I was soft, I was I was weak minded, I was I was not nowhere yeah. nowhere near as good as I could have been. And that comes from not working my hardest. And if I wake up every day with a, a certain mentality that that tells myself, if I outwork the good players, then I'm going to be great. And I think that comes down to working your hardest. And if you show that to your coach, uh, it don't ma- It doesn't really matter 
how great of an athlete you are. If you outwork someone else and you show that you can be just as capable of filling in for a position as someone who's already committed to go Division One, you're going to get your shot, whether it's at that person's position or a different position. And uh, the second one is it's very important. And honestly, like the rest of these pretty are. They're all pretty short and basic, but – they're, they're complex when you think about them. And this one says, have a great attitude. And I can, I can uh, tell some stories about my experience with having a great attitude. Uh, but I'll let, I'll let Gannon tune on this one first, too. Yeah, I mean, having a great attitude is just kind of like the foundation for just enjoying being there, whether or not you're playing or not. You know, just kind of just having a good attitude when you're talking to people, you know, just kind of shooting ideas off people talking about stuff in their lives, you know, off the field stuff, how their family's doing, you know, friends, girlfriends, what other, that type of stuff's going on. What's going on in their life outside of baseball, because that attitude then will just, you're looking out for people. You, you're getting a purpose out of being the other than just Zach, the actual athletic activity and that type of stuff. So I think that's really big. The attitude's big because you got to also have to, um, have a strong mind through all this because you, you might not always be playing and that's, that's that happens in a lot of sports because not everybody can play on a full roster. And for in order that to happen, you just have to be able to push through it. And even though, cause I mean, I'm speaking from experience with sometimes with this, with baseball, you got to kind of buy into your roles. I feel like that might be one of the next couple bullet what points. What does that, what does that mean? The buy into your role. Mm -hmm. It's because not every player on the team is going to have the same role. Let's, let's be honest. Sometimes you're going to be, you know, the lead player, the quarterback, whatever, the star pitcher. The, and sometimes you're going to be on the bench and you're going to get one A-B a weekend. You know, you're going to play special teams, that type of stuff. And you're going to be on the field for five to ten minutes a game. Or you're not even going to play and the coaches just trust you and you're kind of like an assistant coach helping out. All those things factor into being a winning program, a winning team, everything for the long-term success. Because all those little stuff put the big-time players on the field in better positions to succeed. That's really what it comes down to in this because all the roles have to be bought in for everything to work as a unit mm -hmm. instead of a team, especially with the different types of sports that you have more guys on the field at once. So if you're having nine, 10, 11 people on the team on the field at once having to do a job, that's hard to keep in order and be successful. And you need people on the outside helping with that. Yeah. And before I kind of yeah, give, I think that's kind of the biggest thing for a team success because it's on and off the field. I agree. Everything. I agree. hundred percent. I think that's, you gotta have that. And that comes with building a program and it starts with your head coach. Yeah. Without a doubt. Before I kind of give my explanation behind why having a great attitude will earn you more playing time. I feel like a good example is right. In, ooh, excuse me. I feel like a right example right in front of me is Gannon. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be bogus. I'm not trying to be rude, but, but Gannon, you, you went to this, this school to pitch, and uh, you happened to get redshirted your freshman year. However, COVID kind of took that season away anyway, so it didn't matter. Uh, this year you go back, you know, you're playing baseball for Central Methodist University, and you're in the same situation as some of these kids uh, that, are, that are working your tail off to try to get more playing time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you, you got more playing time in a sense that now you're running bases for the team. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you're a pitcher only, which you've mentioned multiple times. But how do you maintain, specifically you, in your instance, how do you maintain a great attitude and how do you buy into your individual role? Uh, yeah. Just just kind of explain that yeah, to I our think audience and how you're handling the situation. At the beginning of the year, I was really struggling with that because I didn't think I had one. And I was, you know, it was optimistic, you know, all that type of stuff, beginning of the year, January, February. And then I was like, oh, crap, I, I need to be able to do something. And then. Uh, it was a weird thing. Like we just, we run sprints and all that. And then we were running, I was running against one of my teammates who was supposed to, who was running bases last year. And I beat him in a 20 yard sprint and everybody thinks he's like the fastest guy or whatever. So then my pitching coach, and then we got up big in a couple other games. We we're up like 20 runs. And then my coach, my pitching coach was like telling her head coach, like, Hey, put Ruck in. He can run the bases. He's fast. So then, Hey, I got one day of batting practice run the bases. And then I've been thrown in the games for the last month. And, the more times I got on, gotten out there, I've had some good success. I've scored, you know, a good amount of runs yesterday. I stole a base off one of the top catchers in the NAI. Like those little things, I'm scoring runs, I'm on the bases, I'm getting in the action. Like that was not my role that I was expecting at all. 
even a little over a month ago before I was doing this. And within a week or two, I was fully ingrained in every single game that people, you know, my name was in the, in the coach's minds about being a factor in the games. And, you know, that's a role and that's something I'm buying into being on a fourth ranked team in the nation. We're 31, 32 and four, whatever. We, I mean, we got a chance to win the national title here this year. And I'm having a, a factor, a role in it to some extent because I'm scoring runs. I've scored the go ahead want runs and winning runs in the last two or three weekends multiple times. So like that's a cool factor that I wasn't that I wasn't expecting. And you know, and the other help the other part that helps with that long term outlook is knowing that I still have three years of eligibility past this year and we have like twenty seniors because of COVID. A lot of people came back. So that's another reason why that helps keep me positive, knowing that I'm embracing my role now, but still know that my time's coming on the mound because that's exactly what I came here to do is pitch. But yeah, man, it, it changes. And it's playing a 50, 60 game schedule baseball season will really test that. And you'll either find it or you don't. And I'm you know, lucky that I found something at least in my first full year. Yeah. And if you don't find it, don't give up. Right? Because yeah. if you love a sport, like it's, it's going to work out. And uh, your role matters no matter what size or or what form it comes in, it does matter. And it does come down to having a great attitude because if you have a, a piss poor attitude, uh, regardless of who you are, you aren't going to play. Uh, Cause I don't know a single college that wants a guy who's, who's talented, but, but is an absolutely obnoxious type of person who's a cancer to a locker room. Uh, people don't want those players. So if you buy into your role, like Gannon did, then you start to have the, a form of great attitude. And once you have a great attitude, you're, you impress the coaches right there because you're a good person. You don't just play because you're a good athlete. You got to play because you're a good person too. It, it's on and off the field things. If, if you're a, a hard worker and you have a great attitude, that, it's you're starting you off. Can't with have the a right cancer mold. on the field. You just yeah. can't have. Well, and that, that kind of leads us right into the third one, which is be coachable. And that I'll I'll, I'll talk about that first. Before <laughs> yeah, Dana. you go first, and then I'll bounce off of it. Being coachable is. It, for for an athlete, especially younger ones, it's hard. Uh, younger athletes specifically, I'm talking like growing up, junior high, uh, early high school stages. You're typically an athlete that you, you come into high school and you're like, well, I dominated junior high. Uh, why why do I what do I need to prove to this coach? But you got to understand, like this coach hasn't necessarily seen you play or seen you grow up and watched you play. So when it comes down to it, you have to be respectful of the coach and give him the chance to get to know you as a person and a player. And you got to you got to do the same for him. You got to get to know him, him or her. I should say him or her. You could you could have a woman coach, but it comes down to it. Being coachable. When, when you get older, it becomes easier. Uh, but there also is players that are that are in the NFL today that aren't coachable. There's there's guys. uh I'm not going to name any names because, like, I feel like it's quite obvious when you see a player in the NFL who's just not necessarily coachable and kind of just rambles and screams and and does what he or she, does what he wants on the field. Uh, being coachable is being someone that is willing to sacrifice for the coach, sacrifice for your team, and establish a sense of trust within that team. And it comes down to it: if you are a coachable player, more than likely you're going to get a shot to play in some facet. And, like, Gannon's, so a, prime, Gannon's a prime example of that. Like, he's he's been coachable. He's had a great attitude going into this season, regardless of if he's gotten any innings on the mound. Like he said, he's a factor with his team because he's running bases, and those runs don't get scored without him on base or without someone on base. They don't get scored. And then he may not win the game because that run didn't get scored. So Gannon's he's factoring into this. He's factoring into this, which what I mean by this is a team, a team-like atmosphere is being coachable. You can't be a cancer. So, uh, again, what's what's kind of some examples that you've had? Yeah, there's there's probably two or three things that I think that are really big in being coachable. And, you know, one of those things is um, just little things like with our coach is, you know, having your good manners with having good eye contact, yes, sir, no, ma'am, those type of things. Like whenever – whenever we get in our pre and post game huddles and all that, you're all, you all maintain eye contact with the coach. I like and if that. If he asks you a question or that type of stuff, it's yes, sir. Like it's, you know, it's not doing it to be like in a mocking way. It's just being respectful because we're, 
reviewing what we were going to, what we're going to do or what just happened. So that those little types of things, and you can tell it's coachable because somebody that doesn't think it's important will be looking off on the ground, you know, kind of just playing with their hat or sunglasses or whatever, instead of just five minutes, just standing there and looking at your coach in the eye and listen to him. But the other type of thing is being able to, I think, learn from your mistakes, you know, learning off of feedback and learning and improving off of that. Because if a coach gives you a recommendation, they're going to be looking for you the next time. And when you're in action, pitching, hitting, running, you know, throwing the ball, hitting a defender, you know, running a route, whatever it is, playing defense, blitzing, those type of things. They're going to be looking for that mistake that you just made to see if you can correct it. And if you can correct it, then they're going to be like, okay, this guy's coachable. He's listening. He's not just doing what he wants to do only. He's more for the team because you really got to have people be unselfish, like we said before, to buy in for the whole team thing. And that's going back to having your role because if not – Being unselfish is a big thing. It's big because – Especially with us in baseball, we have a we have like a top ten offense in the in the whole NAI. But sometimes some of our guys like to swing for the fences and take some big cuts instead of just hitting the ball and taking a single or a double and just scoring runs. So sometimes we live and die by the home run ball, which yeah, Bryce, that's everybody. Bryce sometimes fell into that when he used to play ball back in the day. But yeah, yeah. So those little things of people that have played that long of. Just being coachable and just, yeah, take it. You know, you're going to lay a sack bunt down. Don't be pissed that you have to lay a sack bunt down doing it because you're getting the runner over. You know, that's buying into the team stuff. And then that shows the coach, okay, he's buying in, he's coachable. We're on the same page. And that's how that trust factor is built, which is huge, especially with the head coach that you have respect for. Yeah, and that when you mentioned the yes, sir thing, it kind of made me think, like, it made me think military right away. I mean, that's, that's what my coach was raising yeah. was on a military and, base. Yeah, you've, you've mentioned that to me before, but what it, what it made me think of is when you're in the military, obviously, Gannon and I have no experience in the military, so I can't speak for it. All I'm saying is the leader of your unit, your captain, or whatever the military term is for it, the leader of your unit is the same for football, for basketball, baseball. The leader of your unit is your coach. It's your captain. Uh, it's someone who's willing to take you into war, someone who's willing to take you into battle. So why would you not be coachable? Why would you not be the player that sits there and understands the fact that your coach yeah. is there on his or her own time? Obviously, maybe maybe getting paid some money, which which yeah, money. It's nice. Don't get me wrong, but this coach is taking time out of his day, time away from probably his or her family, his or her kids, his or her friends, instead of on a Friday night when it's Friday night light football. Uh, Instead of being out at the bar with with his or her friends, he, he's out coaching you. A you six, know, I think sixteen, seventeen year old kid. One of the key things just to build off this, and you can keep going, is you also got to hold the coach accountable during you this do. too. You because do because if the coach is not doing what he or she is supposed to be doing and maintaining that role model figure and being somebody there all the time, then it's hard for those kids to be accountable and be coachable if they don't have that trust. So it also comes from the coach being able to sustain that pro program and build it but that's also a side factor that sometimes if a player gets a bad rap or something that he's not coachable well it might also be his position coach or his head coach or something as well yeah i agree coaches need to be held accountable ju just as just as much i'd say i, I not think more yeah in order to have a healthy relationship and in, in all facets of life there has to be trust there has to be a bond uh so for me when i want to be a coach I want to establish a relationship individually and then build on it in a team-like manner. Because uh, that's the transparent. Society. Yeah, that's it's the, for real. And it's that, that's the that is the society that we live in today. <laughs> a little rusty. Yeah, we are rusty, but all right. The society we live in today, uh, it doesn't do well with with non relationships. Like we, in order to be successful within sports as a coach, as a player, you now need to have individual relationships with your players, with your coach. And if you have that, then I don't think being coachable is a problem. I think I think you start to see that issue slow down and hit the brakes a little bit because I think uh, coaches are trending in the right direction towards being, being more accountable of their players, and I think players are holding their coaches more accountable nowadays too. So I think that's something you've seen a shift in over the past, past 10, 15 years, I'd say. On uh, the fourth one, the fourth and the fifth one kind of go together, and we've kind of talked about them, honestly, and already, I think two of our episodes, we've already covered them, uh, but we can kind of go over them a little bit. Uh, but the fourth one and the fifth one, we'll just run them together, and the fourth one is be a great teammate, 
And the fifth one is be a leader. And I'll just mention the be a great teammate. And I think what that comes down to is it, it, it comes down to the relationship thing. If you have a relationship with your teammate, it, it almost comes down to a brotherhood, brotherhood or a sisterhood. Like you have to have and maintain a healthy relationship for at least the entirety of the season. Like you guys don't have to, you don't have to absolutely love each other 24 seven and, and uh, go to the movies with each other and buy each other Taco Bell. Like you don't have, it doesn't have to be like that. As long as you hold each other accountable and be there for each other when you're at war, you're at, you're, you're in the battle uh, with a game. Like you gotta, you gotta be willing to sacrifice for one another. And uh, kind of a thing that you hear from the military as well is never leave a man behind. And I think that relates to being a great teammate and being a great leader. Uh, don't leave a man behind when, when you're playing a game, when you're, when you're in practice, if, if someone falls down, you'd be the first teammate to run and pick them up, yeah. pick them up, get them, get them back on their feet and tell them, tell them, get them next play. That play doesn't matter. It's over with. It's in the past. Reflect on it, move on and ball out the next play. That's, that's how it should go. If you're one of those players that's willing to back up your teammates and show them that you're right there when they get knocked on their back, they're going to trust you. And when they begin to trust you, it's going to make things a lot easier for your team, a lot easier. Uh, so what do you think, Ann? No, I think being a good teammate's one of, if not the biggest things here with, um, cause I know that's the main reason why I still enjoy being here at Central Methodist is because of the teammates and all the team atmosphere that we have with 30 plus guys on our team, because <clears throat> there's no egos involved. You know, there's no people that stick out like a sore thumb or anything like that. There's no people that you don't like personality wise, like everybody gets along and we're all friends. There's like the family atmosphere. It's kind of like with Bryce and I, with our old sticks team, with our travel days back in the day with baseball. It's we still talk. Some, we still all talk. Yeah. And we know each other. And it's that type of vibe here, even not so much on the family level because people are from all over the world, really. And um, so, but when stuff, when we, when we have a day off or we have a break, we have time to get together majority of everybody comes out and that rotates and everybody comes together and it doesn't we don't have clicks we don't have other little side stuff that goes on during that time because people don't like each other everybody gets along and we have a good time together and then that makes being at the field and doing all the other prep to win the national title win the conference all that makes it even better because you're doing it with people that you know will go to war with you yeah somebody that you'll go to war with for so it's it's a it's really big and that has nothing to do with your athletic ability or anything you can do on the field and it's another big thing to if somebody's struggling on the field don't let that affect being a good teammate with them off the field you know still pick them up still talk to them don't treat them different just because of their poor performance at that time because it's human everybody's gonna go through it nobody's perfect but so that's I think that's really big and that's something that I try and do I always try and go out of my way every day to ask my teammates if I when I get there, hey, what's up? How you doing? You know, what's going on? If I know some people, know their family, ask them how they're doing, that type of stuff. I mean, there's little things that it's like, okay, it's just not saying, hey, what's up, and walks away. Yep. Those are little things that just, it makes the other day, person's day better. It makes you feel like you're doing something. So, Yeah, I agree 100% with everything you just said. Uh, and I think another important thing for, for being a leader, I feel like it's simple. We've explained that. Uh, yeah, we've we hit that. We've hit that on the – Hit the nail on the coffin with that one. And to me, all, all being a leader means is be vocal. And if you're not vocal, speak with your actions. If you carry yourself uh, in a manner that you, you guide other players and you guide your coaches and you, you show them that you're willing to, to have that trust back and forth and uh, you don't have to talk, you don't have to be a screamer, you don't have to be someone who, who's pumping you up before the game, as long as you speak with your actions. Yeah. You speak with your actions – where you speak with your words. When it comes down to it, uh, that's what a leader is. You got to be someone who's willing to to uh, take your team into battle. Uh, so now that we've talked about these five characteristics, why do all of these matter to get you more playing time? And for me, all of these matter to get you more playing time because that's exactly the type of player that you want to be. Those five characteristics examine a, a ideal player. An ideal player is someone who who fulfills those five roles, those five characteristics. And if you fulfill those and you work towards being the best you possibly can each and every day, 
on and off the field, then then you'll play. You'll play. And don't be the player that <clears throat> that if you're in college, let's for example, you're in college and I think Jalen Hurts is a incredible example of all of this. Uh, you want to you want to learn how to earn more playing time and and be an ideal teammate and be a leader. Look up Jalen Hurts and look at about look up his story at Alabama and what he had to deal with and and how it uh, led him to Oklahoma and led him to being a starting NFL quarterback now. Uh, Jalen Hurts was benched in the national championship game. Now imagine that feeling, being the starting quarterback and getting benched. And and Alabama goes on to win the football game. I mean, we could talk all day about Alabama football, Nick Saban, which that's just mind-blowing what they've been able to accomplish. But Jalen Hurts was, was a great teammate in that situation. He was a player that was respected for what he did. He cheered on I mean, to he was He was flying all over the field. It was he like was. He was the backup the whole year. Exactly. And if you are that type of person, you, you props bet. Props to you. you. You bet. Yeah, props to you for sure because it's tough. You're going to have your struggles, but you bet you'll play. You'll bet you find your way. And, and Jalen Hurts did in Oklahoma. Balled out. <laughs> balled out and got drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles, and now he's a starting quarterback in the NFL. Yeah. And the Eagles just – just traded their uh, ex-starting quarterback, Carson Wentz, who had millions of dollars to his name for for Jalen Hurts because he's that he's that type of person, he's that type yeah. of player on and off the field. So if you follow those five guidelines, which there's more, there's more within it, but if you follow them, I promise you that's the blueprint to to getting some more more playing time on your your uh, specific teams. So again, you want to wrap this one up and. Yeah, I'll say a couple of final thoughts and then yeah, then I can wrap this up. But you know, I think it's it's really big here with this because if you can fine tune just a couple of the things that we pointed out today, pick one or two. The biggest thing that we talked about today, a lot of them don't have to do with your performance on the field. And that's where you can really gain ground on your teammates. Because sometimes you have to be selfish and do what's best for you mm-hmm. so then you can succeed and be on the field. And those are those off the field things about being a good teammate, doing those things when nobody's watching. Those little things improve yourself. That's going to give you a head start on some of your teammates on a coach. And a coach is going to take one time for a coach to notice that. And they're going to take recognition of that. And they're going to have that as a deciding factor for letting you get, for letting you to be able to contribute in a game atmosphere at some point. And you won't even know it. So that's really big. But yeah, I think we hit the nail on the head with a lot of these different types of things. And, it's kind of funny because now we're uh, talking about material that we've already point or points of it that we've already talked about and covered for a whole nother episode that we've didn't even know was on some of these bigger things that we've talked about. So that's pretty cool. Cause mm-hmm. we know a little bit what we're talking about sometimes, sometimes, but, but uh, anyway, up. before Gainer wraps this up, Gronk spike the subscribe button for us, leave a like and comment as many times as you'd like. We love the feedback. We love to interact and, Maybe we'll be going to Instagram Live or Facebook Live here pretty soon when Gannon gets some free time and he's yeah he's not uh, <clears throat> doing too much homework or, or uh, laying in his bed. Oh, yeah. But, no, Bryce, I actually caught Bryce off guard for this episode back. He forgot our sponsors, so shout out Bakker Auto Group, right. 312 Beef and Sausage, and uh, Driftless Area Co. So <clears throat> shout out all those sponsors. Keep doing that stuff, guys. Keep running up our stuff on YouTube, run up the views, subscriptions, all that type of stuff. Hit us with a comment for some feedback. Hit us up on social media. Anything you want to do, send in your videos to Bryce or I to be on a YouTube video for kicking off us being back after our break. Just keep engaging. That's all we want is fan and engagement right now just so we can improve ourselves. And I think this was good to get, break the ice and get back to it. Yeah. And before before we end this, I just want to say, well, it, we're recording on Wednesday, but uh, technically we dropped this on Friday. So uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow, Saturday. Um, we'll be yeah. dropping an episode of – I guess we can reveal it right now because, I mean, it doesn't really matter. We're dropping Saturday. So the story of William Gustafson and Hayden Neuendorf will be dropping Saturday. We'll – We'll drop a full profile for you guys uh, here pretty soon. So uh, we'll catch you guys Saturday. Hope you enjoyed this. Yeah.